Thanks for the short introduction. So today, totally aligned with the, actually the topic of your group, uh, we'll talk about privacy by design. Actually, uh, I'm a lawyer, so it's based on, uh, on the law and privacy design for personal data has specifically been laid down uh, for Europe within the general data protection regulation. And um, based on that article, the European data protection supervisors have provided some guidance. Uh, which has been criticized by some um, individuals I know of uh, who have to work with it in practice because of actually what was just mentioned in the introduction. Um, there is perhaps a lack between the theory and how you should apply it in practice. Uh, what I want to do to you, uh, what I want to do today with you is uh, go through the principles, the requirements and what needs what needs to be done and then um, discuss the options of how to make um, that leap towards applying it in practice. First, a bit about me. Who am I to explain this to you and to tell you um, how the law um, should be interpreted, um, uh, especially also in this respect. Um, my name is von der Laan. I'm a lawyer and a partner at the Data Lawyers. Uh, it's a law firm specialized in privacy and IT law. Um, besides uh, being a uh, practitioner uh, as a lawyer, I also um, I give lectures, uh, guest lectures at Nairode University and Windesheim University of Applied Sciences. Next to that, I wrote uh, a basic book about privacy, the Bone Basics Privacy Law, or it's in Dutch actually, the Bone Basics Privacy Rechts. And um, I'm an active member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals, currently acting as the co chair for the Dutch chapter. And that is actually um, how I came to know Isabel and how we got in contact and arranged for this meeting for today. So I explained a bit about the setup. This is an overview. Um, so first the principles, then uh, uh, a bit about the requirements and the requirements. So the general lawfulness, the processing purposes, data minimization, accuracy, um, accuracy, security, and data breaches, third party safeguards, and also individuals' rights and control. Um, the last part, uh, implementation. Oh, I'm sorry, Let's skip to the next slide. Um, last part, part four about implementation and um, privacy by design in practice. Um, it's a specific topic um, at the end of the presentation, but hopefully uh, we'll get to talk about it also during the presentation. As we already stated in the beginning, please don't hesitate to interrupt. I'm, uh, I very much welcome any inputs and thoughts or suggestions or questions any of you might have. So first, um, a bit about the principles and uh, the law, what it's uh, stated. So um, data protection by design and by default needs to be implemented in an effective manner via appropriate technical normalization of measures. And um, it, it needs to integrate the necessary safeguards into the processing activity in order to meet the requirements of the GDPR. That's quite generic, I think we can agree. If you look at the legal text and um, it's a bit more specified for uh, data protection um, by default that it applies uh, that the manner in how uh, how you which you should apply it also depends on the amount of personal data, the extent of the processing, the storage period and accessibility. So that um, specifies a bit what considerations you need to take into account when um, determining how you want to apply um, privacy by design and also um, the fact that is uh, that you may not make the data accessible without individuals intervention to an indefinite number of persons is of course a clear uh, a more clear uh, statement of course in practice it's it depends when is it an indefinite number of persons if you uh, engage a service provider or uh, and often, uh, as we know, service providers engage sub sub service providers, et cetera, et cetera. And does that qualify as an indefinite number of persons? Or if in the agreement with these parties, specifically the data processing agreement, if you have appropriate safeguards in place 
um, about, for example, the access policy that such processor and subprocessor need to um, have and also enact, then um, does that prevent that you uh, fall subject to this clause? That's, I think, a very um, interesting uh, question in practice and needs to be determined on a case by case basis. So, uh, data protection by design and by default, the principles. Um, I just mentioned that there is the uh, publication from uh, the European uh, Data Protection Authorities, the European Data Protection Board, they are called the EDPB. And they provided some guidance on how to uh, apply uh, the privacy by design requirements. Oh, yeah, I, I should mention that. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I was already ca called out on it on LinkedIn. Um, I say privacy by design. Of course, it's much broader than data protection by design and by default. However, if I continue to talk about data protection by design and by default for the next 40 minutes, it will be a very uh, long presentation. So I shorted it uh, by uh, just stating privacy by design. During this presentation, I mean the subcategory data protection by design and by default. Um, anyways, so the EDPB, the European uh, Data Protection Authorities, they provided some guidance. But what is very interesting is that before that guidance was provided, there were other local um, supervisory authorities, and also ENISA, that also provided some guidance in this respect. And actually, not much was done with it. it, <laughs> it I think they had a look at it before they prepared, of course, the final guidelines, but um, they are not. Um, all integrated in the uh, version that has been published. So what I did is in the first part, I took a look at those other documents and included um, the uh, principles that they included that are actually not in the EDPB guidance. So what do we have? Um, the fact that it should be proactive and not reactive. So preventative and not remedial. I think uh, we all know what that means. The whole idea is that you act upfront and not after things go wrong. The whole uh, data protection by design and by default idea is that you build it into the design before the design is finished. And of course, that's uh, a challenge in uh, practice, how to um, yeah, uh, make sure that happens. In um, the ADPB guidelines, some mention is being made about uh, the DPA and that it can help uh, a data protection impact assessment procedure. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, a short, um, uh, short sidestep to the DPA. It's another requirement uh, under the GDPR uh, that um, if it may concern a high risk processing, you need to perform a DPA. Often uh, it's a questionnaire. You need to fill out a questionnaire. Uh, people from the business who are familiar with the process or the system uh, being developed, they need to fill out the questionnaire because they know what's happening. The questions in this questionnaire are questions like, what is the purpose of the system? What kind of data will be included in the system? Who will have access and what kind of access, read or write, etc.? For how long will which uh, categories of data in the system be stored for? When will they be deleted? Will it be deleted automatically or manually? Who will ensure that actually after that time frame the data is deleted, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So the total um, process of the new system um, uh, or two is actually being mapped out in such a DPA to determine whether uh, uh, there are high privacy risks involved and whether uh, those privacy risks can be mitigated. So it's meant to uh, both determine the risks and to uh, prevent those from being realized in uh, practice. And although um, the EDPB guidance about privacy by design does mention uh, this DPA process as being um, a good tool to determine the um, uh, security measures that need to be taken. I think um, what may be lacking is that the whole DPA procedure can actually be used upfront to ensure the data protection by design and by default is being implemented. Because what can you do as a company? You can link the data protection by design and by default procedure to your DPA process. And that's actually what I recommend. What does that mean? Um, well, often to comply with the GDPR, companies have a data protection by design and by default. Oh, now I did it. <laughs> I, uh, 
I mentioned it uh, full out, uh, but uh, companies have such a procedure in place. And um, I think uh, many of you will have had a look at such a document uh, once or twice. It's a long document oftentimes, and it sets out what companies should comply with, how people within the company need to process the data. Actually, what is set out in such a policy is what we'll uh, get into during uh, the remainder of this presentation. So bear with me, but it's not set out how it is ensured that they do uh, implement it in practice. And if you link the chapters of the data protection by design and by default policy to the various questionnaires, um, the various questions, sorry, in the DPA questionnaire, then you ensure that um, when uh, a tool or a process is being developed um, and a DPA is performed, that's the person assessing the DPA. So oftentimes, uh, in first instance, the privacy officer or someone from the legal department, and uh, as a second line, of course, also um, the data protection officer, if um, a DPO has been designated, that they know when they ask the questions and when they determine um, what their uh, assessment will be about the DPA, so whether they uh, think that additional measures need to be put in place or um, yeah, that's not required, or whether um, the whole tool is um, yeah, so uh, in, not in line with the GDPR and the privacy requirements that even if additional measures are uh, implemented, it uh, will not become privacy compliant. When making that assessment and writing down their assessment, they can refer to the various topics in the uh, privacy by design policy. So that's what I uh, was missing in the EDPB uh, policy and what I think is a very um, good uh, practice some companies actually already implement in this way. Uh, the only thing, and I, I am aware about that um, before any of you uh, perhaps notice this, is that um, the whole um, yeah, the crux in uh, good English, uh, whether this will work or not, is that you need to have a DPA procedure in place. So some people say you just move the problem to uh, another uh, privacy compliance part instead of the problem of the privacy by design procedure. You have a problem of the DPA procedure. However, the DPA procedure is more um, something tangible because it's a questionnaire. So it's not a procedure which is like very generic and how how can we check whether it's actually being complied with it is a questionnaire there's a process often attached to the questionnaire so which persons within the organization need to initiate it which persons need to fill it out who is involved etc cetera, etc cetera. and if you implement it as a procedure then um, you safeguard that it's applied in practice so that's um, about uh, um, preventative and not remedial part. Um, ideally, of course, it's preventative and not remedial. The EDPB also states that you need to be able to, um, uh, yeah, to uh, check whether it's actually being applied in practice and, of course, uh, document this so that if some of the supervisory uh, authorities have any questions about this, that you are able uh, to show uh, that it's actually applied in practice. Um, later on, I think I included a slide on this. Um, I think it's good to bear in mind that internal um, auditing is, of course, an ideal tool to check whether your uh, all your guidelines or the PF procedures are in fact applied in practice. So then on to the uh, next one, uh, privacy as the default setting. It's um, Sounds very easy, I think. Of course, there are a lot of choices uh, when setting up, um, yeah, when uh, designing and um, implementing and testing uh, a new tool or a new system. When uh, when it's stated privacy as a default setting, it implies that there is the choice between privacy friendly and not privacy friendly. But that means that the people involved in the processing, uh, sorry, in the development stage they need to know what is the more privacy friendly setting and what choices can be made and what are the implications of the choices they make when designing. Um, to ensure that is in fact the case, um, I think, and also it's included in the opinion, that awareness is very important and not just awareness that data breaches should be, should be notified. Of course, they should, and that's very important, but also awareness about what is privacy about? What 
uh, when you start um, uh, developing a tool, what kind of uh, design choices are there? And of course, that can vary depending on the organization um, you work at or you work for. And um, if there is a co true collaboration, um, when you walk through the entire uh, development process between um, the tutor, so perhaps an external legal expert, perhaps the internal uh, DPO or the internal privacy officer, um, in collaboration uh, with the business and with IT department, and you discuss all the choices that can be made and um, what uh, options there are and what the privacy implication is. It doesn't necessarily mean that always the, the most privacy friendly option needs to be chosen. Uh, it's of course a balance of interest. So sometimes to uh, for the proper functioning of a tool, um, you need um, all data. <laughs> Uh, for example, uh, you have available and not just a specific category or just the data about one day. If you want to analyze the trends through the years about someone's behavior, then you need the data through the, throughout those years and you can't justify it with the data about one year. So um, depending on the purpose, what you want to use it for, you may need um, to make the choice that it's not per se the most privacy friendly choice, but you've made it in a deliberate manner knowing the privacy implications and also considering the impact and the necessity which is also something uh, we'll touch upon uh, later on during this presentation so privacy can in that way be embedded into the design um, what's also i think interesting is that um, oftentimes people uh, think about privacy as um, being something that would oppose the functionality of a tool or a system. So they say, no, 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 we need to have it working properly. Or um, first, let's think about the purpose of the tool. And then afterwards, we'll have all the hurdles, such as privacy. However, um, it's much better, obviously, if, if within the organization, the ID is, and I don't think it's just an ID, but it truly can be, that um, by including privacy upfront and by making the tool more privacy compliant, um you can also use it um to your benefit so when you start marketing the tool internally as well as externally and privacy is well arranged for you can use it you can say look there is full user control um we uh, well often of course uh, you read about the full gdpr compliant tools which is up to debate whether they all are but it can be used and it can make um, the uh, consumers or if you want to market it to uh, external clients more comfortable and can work to your benefit when they have to choose between your company or your tool and that of a competitor. Then end-to-end -end security, full life cycle data protection. It's important to um, have a look at the full life cycle of the data. So oftentimes when um, a tool is being developed, then there's one um, phase of the data processing which is being uh, taken care of, the data processing within the tool. But how does the data end up in the tool? Where does it come from? And how is that connection secured? And are there any um, links, any um, uh, APIs, for example, to other tools? How is that arranged for? Which is, of course, um, just as important as the security of the data inside the tool itself. Visibility and transparency, keep it open. Um, it needs to be clear how it works, what data is stored in what manner. This also touches upon uh, the obligation of being transparent um, under the GDPR uh, about the manner in which you process the personal data. So you need to inform um, the people about whom the data are about uh, what you're doing with their data basically. And of course, um, much more information. Um, respect for user privacy, keep it user centric. Um, nowadays, more and more, we see uh, the um, uh, my account environment. So there is an environment within uh, a website or within a portal or within a tool. And in that um, environment, the person about whom the data uh, is, so the data subject, the individual, that person can um, change the data, for example. So it's uh, you can use it to keep the data up to date and also uh, you can uh, use it to keep the individual more in control. I think 
um, yeah, it's a bit of an open door because it's now being used more often and often, but still uh, good to bear in mind uh, that if you're not able within a tool to use something like this, perhaps other options can be used, of course, um, in the uh, blockchain community. Um, keep it user centric is also um, yeah, something that's much uh, being discussed. Then the risk assessment, determine the related risks. That's also part of the DPA and should also be part of the privacy by design uh, procedure. So, um, Vone, I see we I have thought, a question in the chat. Not sure ah, if you great. want to. No, I, yeah, I want to answer, but I, uh, I don't see a chat actually. I'm sorry. Can you uh, read uh, yes. it out? Question from Annie. Uh, it says, but if the purpose is clearly stated on data capture accordingly, is that the best choice anyways? Yeah, so this was related. Asked... Yeah, this was related to the discussion that you uh, had, I think, on the privacy embedded into design. And when we said, like, okay, sometimes we don't make the best choice, right? Like we make some compromises because we need the data for, say, uh, finding out a trend of a particular, say, data subject or something like how his behavior has changed over the years. Uh, I think that was the discussion point where you were talking about. And the obvious choice that I would make in such a scenario is yes, that I need your data to be kept for 10 years, but then that, that's the st stated purpose that I'm having there. And then I'm capturing or keeping the data for say 10 years. Then that's always the best choice for me, right? It's not that I'm compromising something on the data privacy there. Uh, yeah, well, good question it actually depends. So um, why, what is the purpose of the tool? If the purpose of the tool uh, the, the sole purpose of the tool is to uh, analyze those trends, then you need it for that period of time. But then perhaps you can have a look at, do you need all the data or uh, is it just about uh, whether someone is learning uh, more efficiently throughout the years, if it's a learning tool, or do you also need the data about where someone lives? Um, so to determine um, statistics about the, uh, the correlation between people moving through uh, various countries and abroad and how they're able uh, to learn uh, and depending on the purpose of the tool. So if it's just about learning or also the correlation with other data will uh, determine um, how much of the data you need to retain and for how long. And so if you say it's more, it's, it's the privacy friendly option to use it for 10 years, I'm not sure whether you need to know uh, to be able uh, to uh, make such an assessment, whether you need it for actually 10 years. So that's what the, the PIA is about. Then you go into this, then um, uh, you discuss with the business. So why do you need it for 10 years? Why won't five years work? Or uh, can we perhaps uh, pseudonymize the data or anonymize it? So we can uh, so we can still use the data, but not the uh, raw data that was collected initially. And um, yeah, using those questions in the design phase um, makes it uh, privacy friendly and makes that you embed the privacy into the design. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Any more questions about this slide? Otherwise, uh, we'll move on to the next one. Well, I just have one, one remark when I did the DPS at customers, indeed, uh, the more privacy invasive the idea was, the more I challenged the business to come up with a, a, a good uh, um, underbowing. And, uh, substantiation? Uh, yeah, exactly. A good substantiation of the idea. Yeah? So indeed challenge them, do you really need 10 years? Do you can't you do it at five years? Do you need all the data? So, uh, that's that's more or less the balance I always look for. The more privacy invasive, the better the business case should be. Yeah, agreed. Thanks. Okay, uh, then we go to the next part about the data protection requirements. So in um, the uh, privacy by design guidelines from the EDPB, um, they uh, state various principles but if you have a good look at those principles, then what you see is basically that um, you need to comply with all data protection requirements. They're all in there somewhere, <laughs> only uh, they're categorized a bit differently under the uh, um, uh, privacy by design principles. But what they state is that um, main privacy compliance, so compliance with all the main requirements under the GDPR should be 
um, safeguarded within the organization. And of course it should be. That's like basically the idea of the GDPR, right? And now it's also the idea in view of privacy by design. What does that mean? What, what is the addition uh, in this regard? That you should uh, make sure that it's uh, compliant upfront and not uh, afterwards, because um, yeah, we just uh, uh, talked a bit about the DPA procedure. What I often encounter is that if uh, the DPA procedure is filled out after the tool is finished, that's not ideal, because then the business team or the development team is very happy about uh, their baby. Basically, they built something and it's it's working properly, and they're totally excited about it. And then you have a talk with legal. And it turns out that uh, it's not compliant and changes need to be made. Changes that uh, were not thought, uh, thought of um, when they were in the development stage. So ideally, if you have this discussion during the development stage, so if the, they fill out the PIA as soon as they have an idea of what they want to build, of course, they can't fill it out completely. The questions will be more to the basis, to the ID, and uh, more like a conversation you have instead of uh, yeah, a, a complete uh, the peer that you uh, uh, fill out. You uh, can have a conversation, and you can also touch upon the basic requirements under the GDPR. You should actually, as um, also mentioned in those guidelines. So, what does that mean? Well, the privacy rules apply to all personal personal data. I'm not sure. Um, does uh, do you have any experience? Uh, any of you? with discussions that um, someone from the business, perhaps you even, uh, thought that there were no personal data being processed inside a system or two. Yeah, I see one hand, I see several. <laughs> and what do you think? Do you actually uh, agree that in any of these discussions, do you yourself also believe that there were be being no personal data processed? No. Well, that's, that makes me very happy, <laughs> although that means I have less to teach. Um, oftentimes, um, the, yeah, the, the, the most uh, the misconception that uh, we encounter most is that uh, uh, from the business, the development team, they think that privacy doesn't matter because they're not processing any personal data. They say, okay, it's not a name, it's not an address. We're fine. <laughs> Is just an IP address or uh, a, a, a number, an allocated number, an administration number, perhaps some data, some other data, but not the personal data. Well, as you, uh, at least some of you clearly know, uh, the concept of personal data is much more broad. If it can directly or indirectly be traced back to someone, it's personal data. An IP address should in principle be considered as personal data. Even a dynamic uh, IP address should in principle be considered personal data and so on and so on. I often explain this by an example about a blue car. Blue car in itself, not personal data. But if it's uh, stated somewhere that I drive a blue car, it becomes personal data because it states something about me. Um, if there's data in a system about me and my name is just replaced by a number, still personal data, it still states something about me. It can be traced back to me only with a little bit more effort. So that's basically stage one, that everyone in the business knows that if they're building a new tool, chances are they're uh, processing personal data. So um, yeah, it's basically safe to assume that you are and go on to the next question. Um, the next question is uh, what privacy rules apply? So this, a bit, this is a bit, uh, well, it's all legal. <laughs> this is a, a bit um, very legal. Um, so. Um, in the GDPR, um, strictly speaking, the privacy by design uh, requirements, they apply to the data controller. However, as also explained in the guidelines of the EDPB, um, if you're a processor, you should, in principle, also um, uh, comply with this requirement. And, of course, if you're a processor, what does that mean? So a company that only processes personal data on behalf of another company, uh, a cloud hosting service provider, for example. Um, but such a company also has its own employees, also perhaps processes some of the personal data for its own marketing purposes or to improve um, it, uh, yeah, the, the, the software it, um, it offers. So um, if there is um, uh, a data protection by design and by default policy in place, 
I recommend to apply to all processing activities and do not um, make a separation between the processing activities as a processor and the processing activities as a data controller within the organization. Then the legal processing grounds. Um, it should be arranged for that the proper the proper legal processing ground is um, um, yeah is is used. So um, those uh, processing grounds that can be relied upon are limitedly stated in the GDPR. Uh, the, the the ones we encounter most often um, for businesses is performance of a contract, legal obligation, legitimate interest, and consent. What does it mean? In short, in short, if you really need to process the data to be able to execute your part of the agreement to which the individual is also a part. So for example, an employment agreement. If as an employer, you want to pay wages uh, to fulfill your part of the employment agreements, you need to process the name, the account number, um, the, the, the wages concerned, of course, those data you process to uh, based on that uh, ground. So performance of a contract, legal obligation, uh, for tax purposes, you need to retain some data for uh, in the Netherlands often seven years. If you retain those uh, that data for that purpose, legal obligation is the processing ground. Legitimate interest and consent are more tricky. Legitimate interest means that you should make a balance of interest between the interests that are um, in favor of the processing. So often the company that is building the tool or the company that is using the tool. And uh, you should uh, balance uh, the, that interest against the privacy interest of the individuals concerned. That's very vague, right? How, how do you balance it? How do you determine whether it's all right or not? Well, there is again, another opinion about this from uh, the European Data Protection uh, Authority, CDPB. It's actually being updated currently. So uh, later this year, we expect an updated version. Um, but what's very interesting um, is that in that opinion, I included a slide about, the, about it later on, um, it is included that the safeguards you put in place, including actually the privacy by design and by default uh, safeguards you put in place, may have effect on the outcome of the balance of interest. So what does that mean? If it's a close call, so if, you're, uh, if you want to process personal data about someone, um, for example, um, what, um, what's being debated is about sending um, mail, unsolicited mail, not digitally, because then we have another uh, law we need to comply with, but just um, hard copy mail, sending it to someone. Then uh, on the website of the Dutch uh, DDPA, the Dutch Data Protection Authority, there is some text that basically states um, you will have trouble basing it on the legitimate interest, in short, if, if there is no uh, um, um, prior connection. So if it's not your customer or um, if you don't know each other beforehand. However, um, if you uh, are very transparent about it, so if uh, perhaps you want to uh, send that email to um, people who visited your website and you inform in the banner, look, uh, if you um, uh, provide us with your uh, home address um, for uh, another purpose, know that we can use that address to um, send your, uh, you uh, by hard copy information about whatever. And if you want to um, stop your subscription, you can always do so and then very easily. So for, by one click on the link, uh, on the website or and that information should, of course, also be included on the hard copy paper. If you um, are more, if you increase the transparency about what you're doing, and if you increase the uh, option for the data subject for the individual uh, to be in control. Um, okay, so this, uh, the example <laughs> I thought of was not ideal because for this specific purpose, direct marketing, uh, individuals already have an absolute right to object. What does that mean? If they object, the company needs to um, adhere to that. So you're no longer able to send direct marketing communications if someone objected, it's final. In other circumstances, if someone objects, uh, you need to make 
again, a balance of interest. This time uh, it's a bit more tricky because you need to determine whether uh, there are no overriding interests that uh, makes you really, really need to process the data. So it's a bit uh, more difficult to um, uh, determine that it's in favor of the company. However, there are some room. If you um, want to, uh, so if it's, a, if it's a tricky call, you can say we build in additional safeguards in line with the opinion about legitimate interest, such as increased transparency and an uh, absolute right to object and perhaps um, enhance security, um, uh, enhance pseudonymization, encryption, uh, you name it. Some examples are stated, we'll see it in the screen later on. Um, and that makes that the uh, uh, balance of interest flips over in favor to the company. Um, that's good to know, uh, I think, because that adds to the importance of a data protection by design and by default procedure. It's not just a legal obligation in itself. As we saw, it's also part of the general privacy compliance framework for all the general requirements. And now it also can be used for the processing ground you want to rely on. So it's getting better, basically, the, the purpose and what it can be used for uh, increases if you have a closer look at it. Why is this important? Sorry, there's a question. Yes, I have a question yeah. uh, related to, to the legal processing grounds. How do you see the integration with the privacy engineering process? I mean, this, as engineer, I mean, you cannot decide yourself what is the, the legal ground. Does it yeah. mean you need to constantly go to your legal department, privacy officer, and they have to take the decision? Do you maybe have any tips to automate it? I mean, in a way that it doesn't mean that it takes really long in the in the process. Yeah, yeah. no, I don't have any um, uh, good suggestions on how to automate automate it because basically it can't. You need knowledge about the legal background to be able to determine what is the best processing ground. And oftentimes, if oftentimes if this decision is uh, laid with business. They make the wrong choice and then afterwards you need to build in uh, the consent options or actually uh, remove them altogether and it's not ideal i think the most important uh, thing to do is consult with each other early on so in the early stages discuss what they want whether probably they need consent or not and if not please don't because um, if the development teams want to uh, make a preemptive strike uh, preemptive strike sorry they sometimes build in all sorts of consent options but they don't think about the repercussions that if someone does not provide consent then that's game over right and if someone wants to withdraw consent then you actually need to be able to uh, stop the processing uh, at that moment and um, retrieve the data from the system uh, to make sure that the processing is actually stopped also for the data you already obtained uh, in the past so consent, uh, if you ask consent for everything, um, it's not uh, that meaningful because people tend to just provide consent or hold, but it's it's not working the way it should be. So uh, in my view, it should be uh, used as sort of a last resort. And first you should assess whether the legitimate interest works and the legitimate interest is more complex because it requires the company to put in effort, uh, to put in effort to actually ensure the safeguards. So like uh, we already mentioned, uh, what data are you, uh, for, for how long a period, uh, about how many persons, uh, what data categories, can you minimize this? Who will have access? Can that be minimized? Do they have read or write access? Can that be minimized, et cetera, et cetera. And the legitimate interest requires you to go through the entire processing, applying actually uh, data protection by design and by default and the data minimization principles and based on that is much more meaningful for the individual than simply uh, including a consent button. And it's also much more um, uh, workable for the company. So it requires some effort, but at the end of the day, you can uh, process the data and let someone object. But then if, uh, if you make a new balance of interest, which is also in your favor, you can still process the data. And then, um, so uh, discussing about these topics, of course, takes time. Um, I don't think it's perhaps uh, depends on the organization and the, the meeting culture. <laughs> Sometimes our organization, whether like meetings every uh, yeah, every hour, basically, 
and everyone is just meeting together and discussing stuff uh, all day long, then of course it's it's a hurdle and it's not ideal for the development process to really uh, get started. Um, I think it's different if you have uh, the core team. So I would say uh, three to four people max uh, um, having a like 50 minute call about, so not 50, but 15 minute call about what is the ID and what are some considerations to bear in mind. And of course, uh, the ID will change uh, over time when they're working on it stuff. But yeah, stuff changes when they're actually uh, developing it. So my uh, suggestion would be that as soon as you know that there is a tool or a system or a process being developed, that you do not just plan one call, but you straight ahead plan uh, like 10 calls ahead every two weeks or every month and not long calls, just 15 minute calls, very short and discuss, okay, where are you at? What's happening? And then if they um, share uh, what they're working on, on or the changes they made, the legal team can share, okay, then perhaps this should be uh, borne in mind, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it takes time, those short calls, although they are short, of course, still they take time, but at the end of the day, it will save a lot of time because it prevents that at the end of the day, when the tool is finished, you need to go back to the writing table and change everything um, again. And that's actually also included in uh, the guidelines about privacy by design that if applied properly, it saves time and effort for all the involved parties because um, if, yeah, so um, I'm a bit moving um, beside my topic, <laughs> outside of the topic, but you can also, um, the questionnaire for the DPIA, you can use to um, apply your data protection by design and by default procedure. We mentioned that by now. Um, you can also use that moment, that questionnaire for obtaining all the data you need for your processing register, which is of course also a requirement for keeping it up to date. And if you integrate it, then you have one moment uh, between legal and the business to obtain all the required data. And you don't have like five different questionnaires you need to share with them, five different calls about five different legal obligations, but you have integrated all in one to um, yeah, make it more efficient, basically. Okay. Um, so, that's about processing rounds. I thought, I just saw we have 10 more minutes. I tend uh, to become a bit enthusiastic uh, when I'm giving presentations, but we have 17 more slides. I'll, um, uh, I think I'll, um, keep it to the ones we, uh, I believe, most important. And if you have any questions about the slides I walk through, then please uh, ask about it now, or uh, otherwise uh, send me a message afterwards and uh, I'm happy to discuss. So sensitive personal data, uh, if you uh, process uh, uh, data that are more sensitive, of course, more uh, strict requirements apply. Legality in general, it's not just about the GDPR, the other rules and regulations also might need to be taken into consideration. So if it's a healthcare provider and they're building um, a, a tool in the healthcare industry, then of course those standards also should be taken into account, also security wise. The purposes, I think this is, oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is most important for, um, but also very difficult. Uh, when the tool is being developed, there is like um, sometimes a vague idea of what what it should do. And often during the process, that idea changes because the data used in the tool or the system, you can use it in various ways, right? And you can use it for like almost everything. The whole concept of big data and the idea that you should just um, process and um, uh, share and store and obtain uh, as much data as you can to build profiles later on. So to later on have a look at what you exactly want to use it for. That's exactly the opposite of uh, what uh, privacy uh, by design is about. It's that you need to have it, make it as clear as possible uh, what you want to use the data for and make sure that you only uh, will process the data you need to achieve that specific purpose. But uh, to make that assessment, you need to have clear what the purpose is. 
And if it changes through the DPA process, through uh, the privacy by design uh, application, that's okay. It can change, of course. Uh, yeah, for uh, its inzicht, right? That's not a problem, but it will impact uh, what you, uh, yeah, uh, the other part. So it will impact what data you want to obtain. It can impact the assessment, the legitimate interest assessment. So it will have repercussions, but uh, it's good to have it clear and to once in a while, when you're in the process, um, again, touch upon this and okay, so what is the purpose? What is the main purpose? Is it still the same or has it perhaps changed over time? If it changes when the tool is already implemented, you have uh, you need to have a look at whether the process purposes are compatible or not. And if not, then perhaps um, you need consent or another way to, um, to fix it. Um, okay. Data minimization. Uh, we also briefly touched about, uh, upon that. What does that mean? It means, first of all, that you need to make sure what you want to do. So there is something you want to do and it's a bit privacy infringing. For example, CCTV. First question, do you need CCTV at all? Is it to register whether people are entering the building? You don't need CCTV. You can have like a simple access system in place. Uh, when uh, well, when someone enters a pin or with a badge or anything like that, you don't need CCTV. That's subsidiarity. Then proportionality. Okay, so we do need CCTV because it's not just to monitor uh, who um, accesses the building, but it's because there was a lot of uh, destruction inside the company building. We tried everything else to uh, make sure it wouldn't happen again. So it keeps happening as a last resort CCTV. Okay, then the proportionality means can we apply it in such a manner that it's less privacy infringing? For example, not 24 seven, but just during business hours. For example, only the specific area where uh, the damage was being done and not the entire room and especially not outside where people walk by. Also the kind of camera you use. Do you need um, face facial recognition? If not, in this uh, uh, example, we don't, then please don't uh, use a camera that uh, offers that uh, option, et cetera, et cetera. So those two uh, parts, the dynamization parts, um, people often think it only applies in relation to the legitimate interest assessment we just talked about. Of course, it's a big part in the, legit the legitimate interest assessment in the LIA, in short. However, it applies always. In, uh, yeah, irrespective of the processing ground you choose. So even if you opt for consent, using consent, still you need to determine this. And it's not like consent is, uh, if you ask consent, then everything is allowed. It's not. Always you need to make sure that data minimization is applied and um, followed up on. Um, so these are, yeah. Homer, we had a, a question on your previous slide. Uh, Francisco yeah, okay. asked with uh, subsidiarity, do you mean necessity? Yeah, I mean, um, I can maybe uh, clarify a little bit of that. The... Um, yes, please. Yes, uh, it's just that in, I know uh, the understanding in, in Dutch is so subsidiarity is, uh, well, that's the word you use it. But I have this discussion before in that uh, um, I think subsidiarity in English, you actually applies more into necessity. I don't know if I uh, like to, if that's something um, uh, somebody else has to hear about it, necessity and proportionality. Is that what you mean in this case? Yeah, it is about necessity because the test you make is, is it necessary to apply it or not? And if not, is there another tool we can use that is less privacy infringing? So not CCTP, but an uh, access uh, portal. Uh, so that's the subsidiarity. The necessity part, the necessity requirement you um, you mentioned, it's part of it. So thank you for clarifying. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's just I think it was a an issue that subsidiary type does not mean the same thing in Dutch and in English. <laughs> yeah, in legal wise, it does because um, it's uh, it stems from the um, uh, jurisprudence from the European Court of Justice and also from uh, the Human Rights Court of Justice. And um, yeah, it's about yeah what we just discussed, that first you have a look at, can we also achieve this uh, purpose in another, by other means, less privacy infringing means. 
is it really necessary to use this tool? And then secondly, proportionality, can we apply it in a different manner that's less privacy infringing? So um, yeah, uh, in, uh, in the legal documents, they do uh, are translated subsidiarity and subsidiarity, and they do mean the same because you need to interpret them in light of that jurisprudence. Ah, okay, okay. Now I understand. Because when I was looking to the GDPR and the EDPB documents, and I did a search with subsidiarity, I couldn't find any any hits. Ah, okay. Yeah, no, it's uh, it is uh, explained in uh, jurisprudence and also about um, subsidiarity and proportionality in well in uh, these guidelines about uh, data protection by design and by default from the D uh, EDPB and before so under the directive we also have the opinion about legitimate interest which also includes some language on that and okay. uh, presumably the new opinion about legitimate interest because it's being uh, updated will also get into that all right thank you thanks for your question yeah thanks okay um so then storage limitation, um, we talked about that. And uh, how is it actually made sure that the data is not retained any longer? Will it be uh, ensured in an automated manner? Or is there a dedicated person that will make sure about that? And how is it um, yeah, ensured that the person actually does so in the process? Um, accuracy, general safeguards, we discussed this. Um, yeah, so, um, I think we have 1 more minute. This is, uh, this is a topic in itself and this, uh, I don't know if you already have a speaker for next time, but if someone has something to say about anonymous data, pseudonymized data and personal data, I think it's a very, um, yeah, uh, a good topic because there's a lot to say about that. Actually, the opinion on that from the EDPB. Is also currently being updated. So perhaps after that one uh, is finished, someone can talk about that. Um, because again, um, in the technical people often say, no, the data has been anonymized when in fact it's not, it's just pseudonymized. So that's something to look into when you receive the documents or the answers to the questionnaire. If it states anonymous data or anonymous data, is it or not? Uh, if third parties are involved, uh, safeguards need to be in place. Transparency. So if you inform the, uh, the people about whom the data are, it needs to be clear, uh, you, not in like legal terms, but preferably in language they understand. Uh, how will they be able to access that information? Uh, for example, also if they go to, uh, to the website by their phone, is it still uh, available? Uh, what information you provide will, of course, depend on the context. Is it relevant? What is relevant? And you can make it layered, especially if uh, if it's a, a tool that you use on your mobile device. You don't want very big, uh, like 12 pages uh, on uh, on the phone. You can make it a click through option. Um, when uh, designing a software or a tool, the right people have should be taken into account beforehand. So if someone uh, withdraws consent, how is that dealt with? If someone wants their data to be transferred to another party, uh, is that someone you, something you want? Uh, you need to be, uh, you need to comply with. So, does the right to data portability will that right apply in that specific situation for the tool you're building? If so, how uh, are you going to deal with that? Um, yeah. So then the procedures document. Audits, training and education, and DPA, we discussed um, a slide about DPA. And this is what I mentioned about the legitimate interest that when making uh, that balance of interest, um, privacy by design and privacy and data protection impact assessments are specifically mentioned as factors that can and should be taken into consideration. That's it. Two minutes over time, and <laughs> I think uh, the last part uh, went quite fast. Any more questions? <laughs>